Hey all, welcome back to the Real Life Pharmacology Podcast. I'm your host, pharmacist Eric Christensen. Thank you so much for listening. Uh, As always, to to keep tabs on the uh, podcast and the new episodes we have, uh, definitely go sign up at reallifepharmacology.com. Uh, in addition to, to getting those updates when we've got new content, uh, I've also got a free 31-page PDF. Uh, it's a great little study guide refresher uh, on the top 200 drugs. Great for anybody that uh, works with medications, works with patients, uh, or is in school taking exams and trying to uh, pass their, their board. So again, definitely go check that out, subscribe, and uh, get that absolutely uh, free there. All right, so the drug of the day is baclofen. Uh, Brand name of this medication is Leorazole. I can't say I see that brand name used terribly often, but I have seen it come across it a couple of times. Uh, This medication is used primarily for uh, muscle spasms and spasticity associated with uh, various muscle disorders. Uh, Off-label uses... um, there are some reported off-label uses such as uh, alcohol use disorder, hiccups as well. Um, me personally, I have not seen baclofen used in those off-label settings, um, but I did want to mention them at least. By far, uh, in clinical practice, uh, I see the, the medication used for spasms or, or spasticity. Uh, mechanistically, uh, this actually works by blocking reflexes at the spinal cord level, so kind of in that central nervous system area. And it's likely due to hyperpolarization of uh, neuronal cells or neuronal endings, and that uh, ultimately leads to to a relaxation uh, of muscles, which obviously helps uh, spasms and spasticity in general. All right, so... When I think of baclofen, one of the things that I uh, hear a lot or that I've seen patients be on quite a bit is baclofen pumps. So this is one kind of unique thing where we do actually intrathecal delivery of the drug. Uh, Now, this is one of the few boxed warnings with this medication, or excuse me, one, one of the only boxed warnings with baclofen. And it's because of the risk of symptoms due to abrupt discontinuation. Okay, so we, if we abruptly stop this medication, uh, we can have a significant reaction because of this. Okay, so symptoms that are going to result uh, as uh, because of abrupt discontinuation uh, include, you know, fever. Uh, increase in muscle rigidity, spasticity, obviously that makes a lot of sense. But we can also have uh, CNS changes, mental changes, cognition changes. And uh, if it's severe enough, it has uh, led to a rhabdomyolysis type situation and death as well. So um, when I think of, you know, the potential abrupt discontinuation reaction with baclofen, uh, it definitely mimics some of the symptoms with neuroleptic malignant syndrome. Uh, if you remember, I, I talked about that in, in previous uh, antipsychotic uh, podcasts. So again, fever, rebound spasticity, muscle rigidity, um, and ultimately uh, risk of rhabdomyolysis and death if severe enough. So again, we've got that boxed warning on abrupt discontinuation. So as a healthcare professional, what I think about here is I really want to make sure that that pump is working correctly, uh, that we're getting medication to that patient on time, we're refilling that uh, medication on time, and make sure that the individual responsible for filling that pump and making sure that the patient has medication um, has appropriate education and training about some of these risks. So uh, definitely, I think, some important questions to kind of ask and assess and tease out from the patient or caregiver, whoever is is managing that that pump, uh, just to make sure they're up to speed with uh, some of the risks if the patient uh, doesn't get their dose. Uh, 
also wanted to mention, so this is is true of oral. Typically, you know, with the intrathecal pump, we think of, you know, continuous delivery and, and that type of thing, and potentially, you know, more aggressive dosing or patients needing a higher dose, um, So and, and it going directly to the central nervous system. Uh, but this syndrome uh, with abrupt discontinuation, we can have symptoms from stopping the oral medication as well. And obviously, as you escalate doses, it's probably a, a riskier situation than somebody that's, you know, just taking one a day at a, at a very low dose, like five milligrams or something. So definitely important to think about if we're on the oral agent, patients have been on it for a long time, they're on high doses, and we'd really like to start to try to get them off of that. Um, you're probably looking at a period of weeks uh, as far as trying to uh, slowly taper that dose down and, and get them off that medication. All right, so that's kind of um, adverse effects when the drug is stopped. So let's talk about adverse effects when the drug is actually started. And as you can probably imagine with any skeletal muscle relaxant, um, CNS changes are, are going to be the most problematic and, and most often sedation. Uh, these are, are generally dose-dependent effects. The higher the dose, the more likely you're going to encounter adverse effects. Sedation, confusion, dizziness, uh, definitely uh, all can happen with, with baclofen and, and certainly something I have seen uh, in clinical practice. Uh, GI upset, nausea and vomiting can happen. Um, possibility to reduce blood pressure. So you may want to think about that in patients on uh, blood pressure medications or they've got a, a history of, of orthostasis. Rarely you may see issues with uh, urinary retention and it's probably going to show up in patients who have um, like a history of, of BPH, for example. Also with the uh, intrathecal administration, there is the potential of uh, creating an intrathecal mass right uh, where the uh, catheter implantation is. So right where the, kind of that, that drug is coming out of the, the pump. Um, so with that, if you kind of create this mass, you can imagine um, that might impair or alter the absorption of the drug. And so what you may see from a, a patient perspective is maybe they've been stable uh, for quite a while. They're doing well uh, at their current dose. Uh, we're having good success. And if you see those benefits start to wane over time, that may be a situation where you want to think about this uh, intrathecal mass development where we're not getting uh, the adequate absorption or appropriate absorption uh, that we, we used to get there. All right, so let's talk uh, pharmacokinetics briefly before I get into to drug interactions. Uh, pharmacokinetics, uh, oral and intrathecal, um, both pretty well absorbed. You know, obviously intrathecal is, is being delivered right to the site, um, but oral bioavailability is pretty high. It's, it's definitely significantly above uh, 50% anyway. Uh, also advantageous for oral administration is it has a quick, uh, relatively quick onset. So you can use it as needed. The onset of action is in the ballpark of uh, 30 to, <clears throat> excuse me, 30 to 60 minutes. So that's a, a nice thing uh, as far as getting our, our patients relief uh, quickly there. Also, of course, I wanted to mention uh, renal function. Um, so this drug is primarily eliminated um unchanged drug through the kidney. So if that's the case, obviously if that kidney function is poor, we're definitely going to be looking at a situation where that drug can accumulate. Uh, less than 30 mils per minute, we're generally going to avoid uh, the use of, of baclofen if at all possible. And, you know, if we get into the, you know, 40s and 50s range, you know, maybe 50s and 60s, we're going to have probably varying dose adjustments where we're going to at least want to monitor that patient for increased risk of toxicity um, if that renal function has declined from where they were uh, previously at. All right, so let's take a quick break from our sponsor and I'll finish up with drug interactions. If you're in the market for pharmacist board certification study material like pharmacotherapy, geriatrics, 
ambulatory care, medication therapy management, or the NAPLEX, uh, definitely go check out meded101.com slash store. Uh, in addition, I've got a list of uh, Audible books that you can get for free. You can get one book for free from Audible uh, if you've never uh, tried Audible before as well. So again, I've got links uh, to all that. I've got Amazon books as well on case studies, clinical pearls, uh, drug interactions, food drug interactions, um, all sorts of unique resources uh, that I have uh, put together over the years. Um, and you can find all those at meded101.com slash store. And that certainly helps us keep uh, this podcast free and educational for, for all to enjoy. So thank you all for the, the support uh, at meded101.com slash store. All right, so let's finish up on drug interactions. So with a lot of medications, we worry about uh, liver enzymes and drug interactions that way. Think of the SIP enzyme system, whether it's 3A4 or 1A2. Well, we typically get to avoid that with baclofen. So that is is generally very, very nice not to have to worry about some of those interactions. And if, and if you think about it, that makes sense. Remember what I talked about uh, with renal function. The drug is primarily eliminated uh, through the kidney. So while we've got to worry about kidney function and accumulation with renal function changes, uh, we don't need to worry uh, typically as much about SIP enzymes. So that is definitely a nice thing. Uh, by far, probably the most common interaction you're going to run across uh, is CNS depressants. So really the, the additive type effects. Baclofen can be very sedating, again, kind of a dose-dependent effect. And other medications in combination with baclofen can add to that effect. Uh, alcohol, benzodiazepines, opioids, uh, Z-drugs like Zolpidem, uh, anticholinergic, antihistamine-type drugs like uh, hydroxazine or diphenhydramine, all these medications can definitely have additive sedative um, and potentially um, CNS changing effects, confusion, dizziness, uh, all those type of, of things. So definitely look out for that and look out for those uh, additive type effects. Uh, the other um, thing that I, I do think about briefly is the, the blood pressure lowering effect. I would say it's, it's not typically huge with baclofen, um, but if you've got a patient you know, particularly maybe an elderly patient that's sensitive to uh, lower blood pressure or they're on multiple blood pressure lowering medications. Uh, that's a situation where baclofen could provide some additive uh, blood pressure lowering effects and potentially increase that risk uh, for dizziness. So important to, to keep an eye on that. Uh, I think that's going to wrap it up for today. Uh, I hit the highlights there. Thank you so much for listening. Hope you picked up a few uh, practice uh, pearls regarding baclofen. If you enjoyed the podcast, leave a rating review on iTunes or whatever platform you're listening on. Uh, I'm greatly appreciative to those of you who have taken the, the time uh, to do that. It helps uh, keep me going as well as it helps uh, my rankings in uh, all the different uh, podcast platforms. So again, thank you all uh, very, very much there. Also, share us with a friend, colleague, a student you're working with, uh, anyone that uh, needs to uh, learn more. Uh, or could always learn more about medications and medication management. If you'd like to reach out to me, comments, questions, uh, definitely track me down, mededucation101 at gmail.com, or uh, you can track me down at LinkedIn, Eric Christensen, PharmD, BCGP, BCPS. I think that's going to wrap it up for today. Thank you for listening. Uh, take care. Hope you have a great rest of your day.